Welcome to the Phase World Podcast. Engaging conversations that cross the boundaries between business, art, and the digital world. credibility in the world is only going to get you so far as a street worker. You know, a lot of people think they could be a street worker because they've been through this or they've been through that or they're coming from the criminal justice system or whatever. But you need to be able to do the work and you need to have a passion for the work. A lot of the people that we work with feel like they've been given up on by a lot of other folks. They've been system involved since they were young, you know, and have just been kind of cycled through this hell. The big things for us is make sure that no young person that we ever work with feels like they've been given up on. Can't deny my feelings for your being, they run deep inside. And we both know a hunger for some lust is all this appetite. I kind of like rode the escalator of drug abuse. You know, I started out, my first drink, I was probably 13. And then by the time I was 23, 24, I was shooting heroin in my arm, you know, and I was just really messed up and in a really bad place. Even though you know this moment may not last past now, it's not fair. Yeah, in my air, Mark, are you wasting my time? We're so we never go into a situation saying, like, you need to do this. You need to do that. That's not our job. It's not our job to tell people how to live their lives. You would just stay because our rhyme, connection is empty. And lately I've been searching for real. Do you remember how at the end of the day, not just young adults, but people are going to change when they want to change. So our job as street workers is to like continuously be there, to continuously chip away, help facilitate change for that young person when they're ready for it. Hi there. Welcome back to a regular episode of the Face World podcast, where I interview unsung heroes and self-made artists. So today I am joined by a street worker from UTech. His name is Jonathan Lundy. What is UTEC? U-T-E-C. Well, it was founded in 1999 and based in Lowell, Massachusetts, UTEC's mission and promise is to ignite and nurture the ambition of proven risk youth to trade violence and poverty for social and economic success. UTEC was also highlighted in the National Institute of Justice 2016 environmental scan of agencies working with justice-involved young adults. But what is a street worker? What does Jonathan do at UTEC? Street outreach and gang peacemaking ensure that street workers meet young people where they're at and serve as the starting point of UTEC's program model. Street workers target those young people who are most disengaged and deeply involved in local youth gang networks. This recruitment and relationship building work sets the stage for street workers to conduct UTEC's gang peacemaking work and to bring disconnected youth through the doors. Why does Jonathan uniquely qualify for this position and how has he contributed and led the program for over eight years? He shares his humble beginning, his first assignment at UTEC, and how he makes an impact in young people's lives. It's no easy job, I know. But Jonathan says that he looks forward to working at UTEC every morning. Many people can't say that about their jobs. Besides street workers and the street outreach program, UTEC offers a variety of programs, including transitional coaches, workforce development, education programs that help young people obtain their high set, formerly known as the GED. They also have youth empowerment corps members, primarily AmeriCorps, and provide hands-on service throughout the service year in 12 different specialized positions, including culinary, social justice, woodworking, education, and social enterprise. When I first found out about UTEC not long ago at a house party, I experienced the outstanding food prepared by the UTEC culinary team. I couldn't wait to share the stories of UTEC. They speak the truth with heart and soul. I hope that you enjoy our conversation and remember that resources and links can be found on phaseworld.com. 
Um, and a quick shout out to my associate producer, Adam Leffer, for introducing me to UTech through his friends, Rebecca Steinitz and her husband, Sam Putnam, who is the culinary innovator at UTech. Without further ado, please welcome Jonathan Lendy to the Face World podcast. For your time, um, you know, I sometimes I take away the privilege of having my guests sort of introduce them uh, himself, herself. But um, I wonder, in a social setting, how do you go about introducing yourself to others? Um, I, guess, I guess it depends on the social setting. <laughs> I guess it depends on if it's a, you know, if it's a, a UTEC event or like a work event, or if it's if it's if it's just um, you know something else. So. You know, no one's ever actually asked me that before. I'm kind of like a, uh, believe it or not, I'm actually kind of an introvert, so I <laughs> really don't go out that much, which is crazy to think that I'm a street worker. Um, I guess, uh, I don't know, I just, you know, I'm just I'm just Jonathan, man. I'm Jonathan from Lowell, and, um, you know, I have a wife and a, a beautiful baby daughter, and I, and I work at UTech, and I've been here for, you know, eight going on nine years. Wow. And, um, you know, I, I love what I do, and I love working with the youth here in Lowell. So uh, tell me a little bit more about how you got involved with UTech. How, how did that start? Oh, God, it's kind of a – well, I guess if you move before I got to UTech, um, I, I went through, like, um, some struggles when I was younger, you know. Uh, I was really into drugs um, from a very, very young age. I mean, from about the age of 13 uh, up until about – 23, 24, I was high pretty much every single day, um, you know, and I, uh, I kind of like rode the escalator of, of drug abuse, you know, I started out, my first drink, I was probably 13, and then by the time I was 23, 24, I was, um, I was shooting heroin in my arm, you know, and I was just really, really, um, really messed up and in a really bad place, and, uh, you know, thanks to, um, you know, having some, some good people around me, I was able to to get past that and get clean and I'll be going on about uh, 12 years actually this um, September, September 2nd, I'll be 12 years clean. But because of all the crazy stuff that I went through when I was younger, um, I, I had been looking for jobs where I could, I mean, I guess it, I guess it sounds kind of corny to say to give back, but to like use my own life story and my own experience um, to maybe, uh, you know, help mold young people, I guess. And I saw a, uh, uh, where was it? It was on Craigslist and I was, I was just looking for jobs and I saw this, this cryptic posting about like, um, an Ameriport position on Craigslist at, at, at UTech. And I didn't even know how to pronounce UTech back then. I thought it was, it's UTEC. So I thought it was like, Uttick. I was like, Oh, what's this Uttick place? Um, <laughs> but I, I, you know, I Googled it and it sounded really cool. And, um, I remember coming into interview and, I remember nobody liking me here except for, which is crazy because I've been here for nine years now. And I remember coming in for the interview process, and the only person here that like uh, that wanted to give me a chance was the AmeriCorps coordinator, this girl Tanya, and she gave me a shot. And I've been here for almost you know nine years now, so I guess it kind of worked out. Speaking of which, you are a street worker. Or... That's right. Yeah, I, I'm a I'm a street worker. I'm the director for the street worker program at UTech. I'm very intrigued by this program. Uh... You are sort of the step zero or one to really be out there exactly as what the street worker sounds like. So tell tell me a little bit more about that. Sure. So let me give you some maybe like a little frame of reference first as far as what we do at UTech. Um, so we've been in, in um, operating now since 1999. The organization started in 99 as a direct result of the gang violence that was in the city at that time. Um, back then there was um, kind of a gang war going on that was drawn along ethnic lines. Um, was there was a large influx of um, Cambodians into the city of Lowell in the late 80s into the 90s, um, and already like a pretty um, a, a large Latino population, and um, some 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 gangs were formed and some violence erupted, and because of that, young people in the city didn't feel um, didn't feel safe in their neighborhoods. They didn't feel safe walking to school. They didn't feel safe because of the color of their skin or maybe because of the color of the clothes that they were wearing when they were trying to to get to class in the morning, whether it was middle school or even high school. And um, because of those factors, a lot of young people were 
um, were turning to gangs when maybe they wouldn't have before for protection because they didn't feel safe in their own community. Um, you fast forward a few years and some young folks were um, ready for a change and sick of the gang violence and sick of all the craziness in, in Lowell. And they came together with some folks from the city and got a $40,000 grant from the city of Lowell, um, which was the money that we used to open our doors for the first time back in 99. And back then we had like, God, I, th I think the space was maybe like a thousand square feet or something. It was really small. There was a closet that, um, you know, doubled as an office. We had uh, maybe one ping pong table and like one half half inflated basketball. And, uh, you know, I've always heard stories of the first day that we opened. There were just hundreds of kids kind of flocking into the into the center because there was nothing else in the community like that at the time. And it was a service that was much needed. So um, that's how UTEC kind of got started. And we had the street workers and we had enrichment programming. And really, it was just a mechanism to keep young people off of the streets and in a positive environment. Um, so we, we did our work for, you know, 10 years. Fast forward 10 years, we went through a theory of change process. We looked at, um, you know, like the, the young people in the city and uh, who we were serving. And we, and we looked at who we should really be serving, right? Like who needed help the most? Um, so we refined our um, target population to um, young men and women that are ages um, 17 to 25 that have um, high levels of gang involvement, um, in, engaged in criminal activities. Maybe they've um, been through the criminal justice system. Maybe they've been incarcerated, right? So we're looking at serving uh, like the impact players, right? Like maybe the 10 percent of, um, of young adults in the city that are causing like 80 to 90 percent of the violence. And those young people who we feel like um, through working with them, we can get the most return on investment from a public safety um, perspective. So that's who we serve now. And um, our function as street workers, we're like the, the, at the very bottom of the model. Like we're the first point of entry for every young person. I would say about – we, we did this um, – Maybe six months ago, all of the young adults in the program surprised us with a street worker appreciation day. And we all went to the gym and they made these like posters for us and all this stuff. And it was really cool. And, and it's never been done. And, you know, we've been in operation for 17 years. That was the first ever street worker appreciation day. So we all felt really good about ourselves. But I remember one of the staff asked a question when we were up in circle and it was us and like, you know, 50 young people or whatever. And he said, raise your hand if the first person that you met, um, you know, when you started your UTech journey was a street worker. And I would say about 98% of them raised their hands. So we're the first point of entry. We're the first face that people see. And, um, you know, we do our work. You know, we're, we're, like I said, we're looking for that specific young person, those, those young people that are engaged in criminal activities, that have gang involvement. Um, so we do our work through street outreach, through hot spots in the city of Lowell and the city of Lawrence as well, um, and also in uh, jails and prisons throughout the state. Wow. It's a lot of really good information. And uh, there's a lot for me to process, even though I feel like it's very native to you. I haven't really been to Lowell very much now that I have been living in Boston for 14 years. I Come visit. <laughs> <laughs> I have to. And I know that the location where you're at you know, has a lot of events and uh, all the other services, which hopefully we'll uh, touch base uh, a bit about as well. But I just learned so much about Lowell's history. I had no idea. I had I have friends who are Cambodian, Filipino from growing up in Lowell, um, and uh, I I had no idea why it you know uh, such a you know kind of a concentrated uh, type of population will uh, reside there. It never crossed my mind. Um, so tell me about. Tell me a bit more about how you approach someone. I don't know how, do you get a piece of paper on your desk saying, okay, today, Jonathan, you need to go uh, meet David or someone. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean, it's, that's kind of how it works. I mean, it doesn't always work out like that, um, you know, but we definitely, it's, it's funny when you talk about doing street work and you talk about it to someone that's never really, um, that has really no idea about it, they just picture us like, randomly walking around the city of Lowell, like, you know, just like shaking people's hands and knocking on people's doors and kissing babies or whatever. But yeah, every, everything that we do is, is really intentional. And I guess it, it has to be, or else we'd just be spinning our tires all the time. Um, so 
Okay, so there's a couple ways that that the job works. Like our the the, the two focuses are our gang peacemaking, which some which we've been doing, like I said, since UTech started, and then also we we try to refer young people to programming. Um, so we have lists of young people that we work with, um, some who are incarcerated, some who are not, and um, every month we do an enrollment, right? So every month we have say 20, 15 or 20 target young people that we're trying to work with to get enrolled. Knowing that we're probably not going to get all of them in that month um, just because of different factors in their lives and barriers that they're dealing with, right? Um, but maybe we'll have, you know, eight or ten young people that are incarcerated. Um, so we'll do work with them behind the walls, work with them when they get out to prep them for, for programming. And then we might have ten young people that are out on the street Right, we're doing home visits. Um, we're helping them out with probation, with parole, any kind of any kind of little thing to to strengthen the relationship and strengthen the bond that we have with them. Um, you know, and usually it's, it'll be those you know fifteen or twenty people that were really hitting hard throughout that month. And then there's also the peacemaking side of it. So you know, street workers all have we all do a lot of the same work, but we all have different roles and different stuff that we specialize in, right? So we have one. Um, while all street workers do gang peacemaking, we have one street worker that's a, the gang specialist. So his job throughout the month is to work with any gang sets that are particularly hot, right? So um, maybe um, there's one one blood gang set and one crip gang set that have been kind of, you know, going at it over the last couple of weeks. So he's going to work with those guys, work with those shot callers to try to prevent any violence and, and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, that's that's. I mean, it's it's kind of hard to to put like how we do the work into a box because mm -hmm. we're always getting pulled in so many di different directions and you really can't put street work in a box because it's like, it's, I don't know, it's like this like organic thing that <laughs> doesn't want to be in a box, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of hard to talk about how we do the work sometimes, but we, we try to be as intentional as possible, you know, and, and a huge part of it as well, of it as well as, um, you know, having like really good partnerships in the city. Uh, street workers um, only as good as, you know, whatever he has in his back pocket for like hooks and for resources, you know. So, like I said, if a young person, um, if we don't maybe have a strong relationship with a young person that we're working with and we need to strengthen that relationship, you know, like I said, maybe um, he's, he's got some issues that he's dealing with um, for probation. Like he hasn't been showing up, his probation officer's riding with him. We have a great relationship with probation, right? So that's a hook right away. We can pull that out of our back pocket, take the kid in and get, and get him squared away. So a lot of it's about... Um, building strong bonds, you know, building strong relationships, um, having those resources and those hooks in your back pocket and, um, and being patient, you know, because we always say like, uh, you know, if everything worked out perfectly uh, in a perfect world, we'd have like 50 new enrollments every single month, but that's not how it goes. And people have issues. And at the end of the day, not just young adults, but people are going to change when they want to change. Mm -hmm. So our job as street workers is to like continuously be there to continuously chip away and um, to be there to help facilitate to, to help facilitate change for that young person when they're ready for it. You know, I, I know when you were at the um, the house party that we were at, I was talking about one of our, our young adults in programming. I've known the kid since he was 12, you know, and now he's 20. And it literally took him like, you know, five, six, seven years to be ready to kind of walk through the front doors. And that's fine. You know, whether it takes two weeks, mm -hmm. you know, or five years, a street worker's job is to continuously be there. Um, you know, for that young person. Mm. That's a lot to ask for. As you're describing this, I think about the level of difficulty that you must face. Speaking of a job with no manual at all, right? There may be some guideline etiquette that, you know, you I'm trying, I'm, I'm writing a manual right now, actually. My boss is making me, yeah. <laughs> Seriously? Is that for internal use only or? It's gonna, uh, well, you know, um, we got some pretty cool stuff on the horizon. We're, we're, um, looking into opening a teaching and learning institute for other, mm -hmm. not only outreach programs, but programs from kind of across the country. Mm -hmm. um, so having this kind of like, like implementation guide and like street worker handbook, you know, could help us with the teaching and learning. Um, so we'll see. It's still in the, uh, we're still working on it. So <laughs> that's incredible. Uh, I, I've, it's so interesting. I've been speaking with several guests lately. Um, in this case, it's actually, a, you know, um, palliative care or cancer doctors who mentioned that uh, unlike living in Massachusetts, there are a lot of services that's just completely inaccessible, unavailable to people throughout, you know, other parts of the U.S. and certainly, you know, worldwide. So they actually wrote together, co-authored a handbook that people 
um, can actually read and follow and to get the oh. best care possible in a way I feel like it's very much re- related to what you're doing um, so I would love to dissect to kind of dig in a little bit more one is how do you initiate a, a conversation and you, you mentioned briefly about your background so in a way I feel that they could potentially relate to someone like you more and have that respect up front how, how do you feel about that yeah I mean it's you know, um, we work with a lot of a lot of young men that have like the, the heavy gang involvement too. So and um, you know and and also like one of the things for me like a lot of the young men that I work with don't look like me. You know, like I'm a I'm a 34 year old white man. You know what I mean? So it's uh, it's it's taken me longer um, to kind of get to the place that I am now than other people. You know, um, all of the street credibility in the world is only going to get you so far as a street worker. You know, a lot of people think they could be a street worker because they've been through this or they've been through that or they're coming from the criminal justice system or whatever. But you need to be able to do the work and you need to have a passion for the work. And I think one of the things that I've always prided myself on is um, the just my, my willingness and, and readiness to be there, right, mm-hmm. and to do the work for whoever I'm working with. And uh, we always say, like, the young adults that we work with can smell bullshit from a mile away. You know what I mean? Um, and also, a, a lot of the people that we work with have, um, you know, feel like they've been given up on by a lot of other folks. They've been system involved since they were young, um, you know, and have just been kind of cycled through this hell, mm-hmm. you know. And, um you know, one of the, the big things for us is making sure, and then, and one of the things that I always like pound home as the director over here is to make sure that no young person that we ever work with feels like they've been given up on. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's absolutely crucial for us, you know. And like for me and for the rest of the team, you know, young folks in the city know that they can count on us, whether they've seen us last week or haven't seen us in three years. They know that they can pick up the phone and call myself or my partners Mao or Johnny or Nemesis and that we're going to be there for them and that we're going to take care of them and that we're going to do the very best for them that we can um, because because we have love for them. You know what I mean? And we don't want anybody to ever feel like they've been left behind. You had shared a story. I remembered a lot of things you said, but one of the things was that when a young person um, had to go to either, I wasn't sure, jail or prison for six months he went in when it was the summertime and he came out it was the winter and he had the exact same clothing on you know short sleeves shorts and you had brought clothes for him could you share that yeah. story again <laughs> that happens that happens all the time actually that particular story was in uh, was in the boston globe um wow. we had a globe reporter come along with us for that release and there's a it was a front page below the fold and there was actually a picture of us giving the kid a hug you know, in his T-shirt, and um, yeah, he was a young kid that we've known for years, a young kid that we worked with when he was incarcerated, and, you know, you get locked up in July, and you got your sandals and your shorts and your T-shirt on, and it was, I remember, it was uh, it was two degrees outside. I was wow. checking the temperature in my car, and uh, he got out, it was two degrees out, you know, and, and uh, looking like he was ready to go to the beach. Um, and, yeah, that's something that we do on pickup days all the time, you know, a lot of when you get incarcerated, the story, the narrative is usually usually the same for most of the young adults that we work with. Mm-hmm. Um, you get a lot of love when you're outside, you're out on the streets, you know, and you got money and you're doing whatever. But you get locked up, and all of that kind of goes away. You stop getting phone calls, you stop getting letters. Uh, a lot of a, a lot of young adults we work with don't really have family, you know, or or, or a supportive family structure. Um, so they don't even get those visits, you know, no one's getting money for their canteen, no one's getting money put on their books so they can make phone calls and stuff like that. Um, you know, but we show up every single week, you know, sometimes twice a week, sometimes more than that to, um, to you know, to sit in circle with them and, 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 and talk and to, you know, try to bring them some hope, you know, uh, and that's, that's a big deal, you know, for people when they're not getting love from anywhere else, you know, for us to come and give them that love is, is really huge. Um, you know, and really a lot of, a lot of young folks that we work with, they get released and they, they have nothing. I mean, we have a young kid who we've, we've known for a long time. Um, you know, he made a couple mistakes and got incarcerated and he recently got out 
and he got released with a hundred dollars. That's it. No place to go, no family in the community, um, like nothing. You know, all he has is us, and all he has is UTech. Um, you know, and you see those those stories time and time again, and it's about you know getting them situated and getting them back on their feet, and you know, hopefully on a better path. Well, that's a very challenging situation to be in. And first of all, shout out to the support network, and uh, you know, you being one of them. Uh, who has your phone line open, but also, as you mentioned, you're as good as the resource that you have, right? You don't have a house with infinite rooms or um, a location that could house or, uh, you know, host anybody, any amount of people. What do you, what do you think, uh, what is that you can do with the limited resource? I, I, I can't even imagine, to be honest. Well, the the good thing about being in Lowell um, you know, and I, I can't speak for other cities, but I can speak for Lowell. We have um, really great partnerships in the city. And um, one of the things that people from other communities have told me is that they're always impressed that like, when you go to a, a meeting in Lowell, it's like everybody's around the table. You know, all the partners, all the nonprofits, and every, everybody's trying to, to do better for the city and to do better for the folks that live here. Um, so that being said, being from this community, we, we we don't have all the resources in the world, but I think we're better off than some other places. Mm -hmm. You know, so in this young man's um, young man's case, we were able to get him, um, you know, a bed over at the shelter, which is down the street from UTEC. You know, we were able to take some money and get him um, situated with some clothes and some toiletries, and you know, pulled some strings and got him working here. Um, you know, right away within like a week. You know, got all of his paperwork cleared and everything like that. So. You know, it's a it's a case by case, and it's always different depending on who the young person is. But you know, in this case, we were able to kind of help him out and get him back on his feet. Wow, fantastic! Yeah. Related to your job, and you mentioned that um, you recruit, and uh, not just the lucky ones, but the ones who really want to make a, a difference will join you, Tech and. Um, I met a couple of very uh, young men, and I at the house party, and you know, I believe at least one of them was also, in a way, rescued and nurtured by UTech, and later on, it has been working uh, since then. So, what do you think are the things that you have to know, sort of, before you go to UTech, versus the things that you you could potentially learn on the job? That's kind of what we talk about in. Uh, career management in general, whether it be in finance or consulting. What are your thoughts on UTech? Do you mean like for for the program participants, participants, or for the staff? For the, I think for the staff. Um, I don't know how many are there, but you know what I mean. Like, what what do you have to know uh, ahead of time? So, um, so I love one of the things I love working about UTech is that our staff is so diverse. Mm -hmm. um, we have people on staff that were incarcerated for five years in state prison. We have people on staff that have PhDs from Harvard. <laughs> um, you know, so it's it's not so much, working here is not so much about like, you know, what what degrees you have hanging on your wall or, or whatever. It's, it's more about like what you know and what you can bring to the table, um, which is, I think, really cool. One of the things about coming to work at UTech that, that people should know if they're applying for a job is that it's um, it's controlled chaos a lot of times, you know. Um, we like <laughs> It'd be nice to think that everything's always easy and everything moves and, and runs how we'd like it to, but, you know, sometimes things get a little crazy. Um, that's just the nature of the work. Um, and also um, the culture here is, uh, is, is pretty awesome. It's really off the charts. It's like one of the most – open and, and, and loving and loudest and like exciting places I've ever walked. Like every, every morning when you walk through the front doors, I've had, I've worked a lot of jobs. I'm 34. I'm not like super old, but I've worked a lot of jobs over the years. This is the only job I've ever had where I'm genuinely excited every single morning to walk into work. Um, you know, the energy here is just absolutely incredible. Um, you know, and we have a lot of fun, you know, and, uh, but at the end of the day too, you gotta, you gotta do your work. You know, and um, sometimes at UTech you have like really high highs, and sometimes you can have really low lows just because of the stuff that we have to deal with um, on a daily basis. But it's a really supportive community. You know, the staff are supportive of each other. 
staff are supportive of the young adults. The young adults are supportive of the staff. You know, it's this, mm. it's this, it's a beautiful thing, and it's a, a really cool place to work. But we're very picky. If, you, if you're trying to apply, if you're trying to apply here, I remember the, the one street worker we had in the interview process for five months. Wow. You know, because we want to make sure we're getting the right person. We want to make sure we're getting someone that's gonna. For, I think for most staff positions, especially those that are doing direct service, when you're working with the young, the young adults. We want people that are going to be here for the long haul. We want people that are here for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. So you are uh, saying you want people to be there for the right reasons. And I'm so into that question because I have been involved in different um, charities and organizations over the years. In fact, my parents were very supportive. So my dad and I had this thing, I think since I was, we talked about it since I was three, then together we got really involved when I was five and have been doing it for a long time. But I did notice over the years, sometimes people just want another LinkedIn badge or another something for them to, to talk about genuinely or to brag about. Um, so what are the, what do you look for? How do you just sort of justify or find that right reason for that person to be there? So as I can speak on, on, on behalf of the street workers. Um, so we're looking for somebody, number one, like, Someone from the community is a plus, right? Because they have that kind of, if they're, if they're from here, right, they can kind of like buy into the mission and, and buy into like what we're doing and the reasoning behind it, right? Because we're trying to better this community and some of the surrounding communities, you know? So being from the community, you can really have like, uh, have a stake mm -hmm. in that. So that's that's one thing. Um, we do, it's not it's not mandatory, but we look for people that have, you um, some some type of street experience mm -hmm. um, for this for this program, just uh, like you, like you spoke about before, um, so they can so maybe it is a little bit easier them for them to relate when they go into a jail, mm -hmm. right, or when they're doing outreach on the street. Um, even better if people already know who you are because they've seen you around, you know, <laughs> have a name in the community, so that's a plus as well. Um, but but more than that is just um, they need to have that passion. You know, and it's and that's why the interview process is so long sometimes because we, you know, it's easy to pretend that you have passion. You know, when you want to get a job, and it's easy to it's really easy to go in an interview real good and kind of say all the right things, you know. But then when we're calling you and being like, hey, you need to come in next Tuesday, you know, from five to nine p.m. and we're not paying you for it, but we're going to take you out on the street and put you to work and see how you do. You know what I mean? It's kind of when the uh, the rubber hits the road, you know what I'm saying? So you, you do a couple of those and see if they're really with it, you know, because they're coming in, mm -hmm. they're donating their time, they're volunteering, they're not getting paid, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, so that's kind of when you can see the, the passion start to come out. Mm -hmm. And we've had people straight up, not even, we've had people set up appointments to come out with this and then not show for them, mm -hmm. you know? Um, you know, we've had all, all kinds of people cancel over the years. And then we have people that really stick it out, you know, and, I mean, you're in an interview process for five months, and you're calling me every single week to see if you got the job yet. You know, I kind of know mm -hmm. that you're with it. You know, and, and it's not like we're a, not like we're a Fortune 500 company. You know what I'm saying? We're a nonprofit, so we're not driving around in Mercedes, you know, BMWs and Benzes. You know, mm -hmm. I got my 2005 Hyundai Santa Fe. You know, this. <laughs> so. That's right. We're, speaking of comfort, you you also have a hoodie on. In fact, um, everybody from UTech that day had some sort of. Um, you know, I like the branding of UTech, um, the the hoodie, the uh, the logo, the video, but at the same time, makes me wonder. That's almost like a target on your back when you are out there. You know, convincing young people to, in a way, convert and to consider a different path. Isn't it a dangerous job? That you know, how do the the, the gang members or the the lead of the gang will, will think about that? I I wonder how you navigate that political water well um that's a really good question so we these are also very intentional the colors that we wear street workers are the only ones that wear orange that's been our color since the the very beginning of, of, of doing this work and we chose orange because it was a neutral color and no gang set in the city had claimed it as their own because that's the way that things kind of work you know every city is different with the gang culture um in lowell it's it's really that kind of like california style like bloods and cribs and people with colors and um, you know, especially back in the 80s and the 90s and early, you know, picking the orange color was was neutral um, and it kind of made us stand out and people could people could see when we're coming. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It could see us from a mile away and, and know as soon as we hit a neighborhood. Um, 
I've never, I've never, I've been doing this work, like I said, now eight, nine years. I've never felt threatened. Uh, I mean, we've broken up a bunch of fights. I've got, you know, hit in the face a couple times, um, mm. but I've never felt, I've never felt threatened going into a neighborhood. I've never felt threatened, threatened going to talk to anybody. And a lot of that is because of the groundwork that was laid even before myself and some of the other street workers came on board, mm-hmm. right? Um, it was laid by the first street workers, you know, that kind of were out there like pitching the program to people and trying to get kids off the street. And and one of the things about about us, we don't, I mean, sure, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the program and we'll preach about that, but we'll never preach to a young adult about what they should do with their lives, mm-hmm. right? Like our job is to help, like I said, I think I said before, to help facilitate change and to take them and put them somewhere else and to maybe show them a, a different path or whatever, but we never go into a situation saying like, you need to do this, you need to do that. That's not our job. It's not our job to tell people how to live their lives. Um, and because we don't go into situa- situations like that, I think we get some some more respect for folks. You know, And we've had situations in the past where we've gotten calls and text messages from shot callers, you know, guys that kind of run stuff for gangs, telling us to get their kids into the program so they can get their GED, mm-hmm. you know, and, and so they can get their their work skills and stuff like that. Because, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Like, you talk about people that are in, involved in gangs and everybody thinks that you know, all of a sudden they think, like, oh, bad, 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 like, they're bad. They're not bad people. Mm-hmm. Like, they're, you know, they're just, they just had to deal with certain stuff in their lives that have led them to this place that maybe a lot of us haven't had to deal with, you know, we really can't put ourselves in their shoes. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're just, you know, if they're just humans trying to kind of live life like the rest of us, you know, mm-hmm. and um, they care just as much as their kids as we care about our kids that are here. Wow. That's... But yeah, you've never felt threatened or anything like that. That's a, such a different perspective. And uh, you don't really have that until you speak with someone it's almost the same as i tell people that if you want to really learn about the culture go to that country don't just read books or even listen to podcasts be there be with the people um uh, what i find interesting is also that there are several organizations that i'm i have involved uh myself in that i find i could see a lot of people similar to my background that i didn't uh, necessarily grow up rich, but I had everything I needed in my life, you know, not for yes. one day that I had, I didn't have a shirt on or I, I didn't have enough food. Um, the electricity bill wasn't paid for. Um, but I notice a lot of these organizations tend to attract uh, sort of the um, upper middle class and uh, hippie folks trying to make a difference in the world, which I think are great, you know, or people trying to write checks or contribute in their own ways. On the other hand, I do have friends who have been homeless. I have friends who had, um, you know, a very, very humble uh, upbringing. But, you know, I sometimes see that they do want to run away from this. It's a it's a history. It's a past. They don't want to uh, look back on. In fact, uh, that they're sometimes the ones who give me advice on, why are you doing this? You know, you, yeah. you, you're not equipped to do this, that you have no idea what you're getting yourselves into. And they have good intentions. And they're right that I'm really, I can be very naive. And um, so, but there you are, you know, you've lived a life that I don't know, you have no trouble talking about it right now, because I think it's in, it's an inspirational, I really laid the groundwork. But how do you feel about what I said? I, I mean, I guess if I had to dissect it, number, number one, like, I think that just in general, people are good people, you know, like most, most people are just good people and people want to help, you know, and, um, it doesn't matter. You don't need to be from a certain neighborhood, you know, or from a certain place to, to help others, mm-hmm. you know, and I, whether you're upper middle class or making, you know, 4 million a year, you know, you want to help someone out, I'm with it. You know, I'm with any, whether you want to donate money or donate your time or donate your, some skill that you have or come to volunteer or come fix a broken computer, whatever it is, you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm with it. We're with it. We, we love people that want to kind of jump on board the bandwagon and, and help out a population that, that needs it, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, you know, and as far as like sharing my story, um, you know, it's, I've heard people, I I know people with crazier stories than I have. Mm -hmm you know, that can, that are able to share their stories too, you know, and it, I mean, it takes time and it gets easier over time, 
you know, to be able to share. Um, but, you know, story, I think storytelling is, is really powerful um, to kind of like give people like a, a window, right, mm -hmm. into your life. Um, you know, and it's a really, it's a really beautiful thing. And we, we encourage everybody at UTEC staff and young people like to, to tell their stories, mm. you know, because, um, because it is so powerful, you know, it can be so transformative, not only for other people kind of like looking in from the outside, but for you yourself, mm. you know, it's, it's empowering to be able to do that, you know, and to be able to share your history. Yeah. I have had guests, like you said, Harvard PhDs or doctors for their entire life. And at the end of the podcast, even, you know, in one hour's time, and uh, I will hear them say, wow, I have never summarized. I've never talked about myself this way. And that was yeah. really interesting. I just learned something about myself and we'll, yeah. we'll be laughing. So I completely agree. But I also find just the, the number, the volume and the variety of the programs provided at, at UTEC, it's just astonishing. You know, woodworking is a, another... I, uh, mattress recycling it's these are real skills and i i really um you know there's such a shout out to people not only who uh, bring these kids kind of uh into a very um safe and friendly environment but actually teach them something like you said the skills that they will carry with them um i remember my mom telling me that she said you will not you know once you you know you won't have this this and that you know as you get older maybe or the money may go away but you still have your skills i know it's such a chinese thing to oh, say oh, that's absolutely right yeah absolutely yeah. right um yeah so we try to um not not only to impart um like a trade you know like the woodworking piece and with culinary and mattress like we're just uh I think one of the main things for us when we bring people into programming, um, we have those social enterprises that you mentioned. You know, we have this like whole array of wraparound services. Mm -hmm. um, you'd say it's really a once like a one stop shop. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? For anybody coming off the street or com coming out of prison, it's like an on ramp to education mm -hmm. and to work right away, right? And um, you know, everybody that come, you know, pe all the people that go through woodworking, if they want to go work somewhere and do carpentry or like cabinet making. That's awesome, you know, and all the folks that go through culinary, if they want to go work at, um, you know, we have a great partnership with Whole Foods. If they want to go work at Whole Foods or go work in a restaurant somewhere, awesome. Um, but they don't have to. Like, we're just trying to impart like, the, 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 the basic skills into our young adults of, like, how to be a good employee. You know what I mean? So when they leave here, they can, like, kick butt wherever they go, you know, so they can kind of, sh so they can be on time, so they know how to how to work with others and like work as a part of a team so they know how to uh, interact and engage with their co-workers, with their supervisors, whatever it is, you know, we just want to, we want to make good employees, whether or not you want to go work in a kitchen or work in a wood shop is fine. You go, you go do what you got to do when you leave here. You know what I mean? Um, but one of the, one of the cool things about the program too is, um, so we have all these different social enterprises that the young adults get to work in when they come here, they get paid, a, they get a paycheck, right? For the full day of work. So it's like a stipend program. Um, we have uh, high set classes upstairs, which is kind of like the new GED. Wow! You get so you get paid for the full day. So whether you're sitting in the kitchen and working, or you're sitting at high set, you're getting your check for the full day, which is um, really really cool. Everyone has access to um, case management. So when you come in, you get a transitional coach, which is like what we call a caseworker. We just don't call them caseworkers because we don't view our young adults as cases. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have caseloads. We have life portfolios, right? And the Transitional coaches kind of walk the young adults through programming here and through uh, whatever barriers they might still have um, on the outside. And even when a young adult graduates and they go get that job at um, Whole Foods or wherever it is, we have a pathways coordinator that will follow them for two years out. You know, so um, even once they, they leave here, if they have an issue with whatever it is, they can come back and talk to our pathways coordinator and he's going get to them, get them laced up and kind of back on track. So um, just wraparound services man and uh we're like we we don't just say that we're there you know for the the participants in our program like we really are you know we do our very best to kind of uh walk the walk you know and not just talk the talk mm. wow i can't believe you you summarize it in in just a couple of minutes uh the the love the level of dedication and thoughtfulness really to clearly this program is designed by someone who has been there and done that you know if regardless of how much of a good intention i have i had 
uh, no, I really truly have no idea how you transition someone into a life that I, I think everybody deserves. And um, so how many staff, staff members versus how many, um, uh, you know, young, uh, young adults are with the program right now? And how many do you see transition kind of into other careers and, and kind of checking in every once in a while? So we have, um, so don't quote me on these numbers, but I think we have about 45, 45 ish full-time staff yeah. right now in a, in a array of different positions. We have close to 170, 175 young people that are on an active caseload right now. Mm -hmm. um, so they get the, that int intensive case management through their transitional coaches. They'll have access to job slots. If you, if you kind of get touched every year, whether it's through a street worker, through an event, through some kind of other program running at UTech, it's anywhere from like, maybe around like 800. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's incredible. And uh, what are some of the upcoming events? I want to close with potentially a, sort of a call to action in case people want to get involved and how do they get involved? As far as folks that are looking to get involved, you can go to our website. Mm -hmm. um, it's www.utech-lowell.org. And in one of the drop down menus there, there are um, there are ways to um, learn how to, about like volunteer opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, anybody really like we, we have kind of an open door policy down here. So if anybody wants to come down and, and check the building out, you know, you can come and check in at the front desk and be like, Hey, what's up? Like I saw the podcast. I wanted to learn more about this or more. About it. Yeah. Like, so yeah, you can, you can just kind of show up. If you want something more formal, you can make a call to the front desk. I think the, uh, the front desk number is like 978-856-3902. Um, you can call them and see about maybe setting up a, a visit or a tour mm -hmm. to come down, or you could you know talk to people about maybe opportunities to donate, opportunities mm -hmm. to to volunteer. I mean, you know, whatever it is, we um we love having friends, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, the more friends we have, the better. Awesome, thanks so much, Jonathan. Uh, this this is fantastic. I learned so much, you know, without working there for one day, but someone like you who have been there for nearly 10 years, you know. All right. Have a great day. Thanks so much. All right, sister. Take care. Bye. Someone who has nothing to steal. That's real. Hey, it's Faye. I'm back for a few words at the end of the show. I hope you enjoy what you heard. You can visit us online at phaseworld.com to find out other episodes from this category or topic or you could explore other awesome people who are artists and designers, digital marketers, performing artists, authors and speakers, entrepreneurs, students, educators, and more. For this reason, we've taken your feedback and created a landing page to most easily navigate by categories and topics. Simply visit podcast.faceworld.com to learn more. Sincerely, I want to thank you for your support. Bye for now. Driven. We're living in a world where girls are thinking diamonds are love We're mining it up to remind us of us Paying for trust, do you get it? She told me Mark, just forget it I want to change this world And girl, I just don't think that you get it This pressure is heavy, not ready to just let you forget me But when this all is said and done You gon' regret that you met me I used to want to find a feeling Now I'm feeling so empty But honestly, I want to thank you for the love that you lent me That's real Staying up and waking up with you And I was sleeping at the edge Oh, there's something we don't need Oh, there's still